Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I see we have a few more people that are joining. Um, what I'm going to ask you to do is um, to type your name and organization in the chat box so that we know uh, who's joining us. And um, if you're only joining by phone, we will ask you uh, shortly to tell us your name and your organization. We had a very large audience last week for the webinar, so uh, we're not sure how many people we're gonna have this week. There's gonna be a slight update um, to the earlier part of the presentation, but if you were with us last week, um, a lot of what we talk about later in the presentation will probably be very similar to what we discussed last week. So, um, you know, if you need to, to drop off the call, we'll understand that as well. So, um, yeah, again, type your name and organization in the chat box. I see lots of people are joining, so uh, do continue to do that so that we can track who's with us. And uh, we'll, we'll begin shortly. Okay, and then uh, in, in case you didn't see the, the beginning slide, make sure you are on mute uh, unless you are uh, speaking to the entire group. And make sure that you have joined uh, with audio uh, so that you can hear everything that we're saying. Okay, and if you have questions or comments during the meeting, please uh, share them through the Zoom messaging box. We will also have time at the end for our questions. And we, we'll actually stop throughout the presentation for questions as well. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to do is to make sure that everybody knows that we are recording this session. And um, our plan is to, to post a recording of the session on our resource page, our COVID resource page. So um, if, if you speak, just to know that you are being recorded. And so um, by participating and by speaking on the webinar, you are giving your implicit consent to be recorded. All right, so I don't have uh, control over the slide, so I'm going to ask um, my team members to go ahead and advance the slides. So for everyone, just this is the agenda for today. We're gonna give a brief background of this COVID uh, situation right now, uh, globally, nationally, and in uh, Maryland. We are going to then talk about vulnerable patients and COVID-19, and we will stop for questions after that. And then we're gonna go into a whole section that talks about any changes that are going on in care delivery in your uh, settings, as well as what uh, we have been doing here at Johns Hopkins. And we'll be talking specifically about adapting workflows, protecting staff, what the current testing and treatment guidelines are, and we will engage in some question and answer and discussion at that point. And then we'll finally wrap up with a section on communication in a public health crisis. So I'd like to thank my colleagues, Jill Marsteller and uh, Tony Bunyasai for participating in this presentation as well. Okay, next slide. So we're gonna cover the COVID-19 background and situation report. Um, and we have some slides here that are courtesy of our colleague, Crystal Watson, who is a senior scholar in the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. Next slide. So here's a recap of the important facts. Many of you are very aware of these, that COVID-19 is a disease caused by a new virus, SARS-CoV-2. It is at least 10 times more lethal than seasonal influenza. Everyone is susceptible, but people who are over age 60 and those with chronic health conditions are at greatest risk. And it's been predicted that as high as 60% of Americans could become infected in the next year. And we're really seeing a lot of that play out right now. Currently, our best tools uh, are identification and isolation of people who are sick. 
and quarantines for those who are exposed to them, as well as social distancing measures. And you've heard a lot about this in, in all of the media outlets and of course in your healthcare settings. Next slide. This is the current situation as of today. We have approximately 1.5 million uh, people who have, have been confirmed to be infected with COVID-19, with coronavirus, um, the new coronavirus across the world. It's impacting every continent, as you can see. Um, and uh, some of the countries that have been really hit hard include our own country, as well as Italy and Spain, a uh, United Kingdom, and, uh, and now uh, Germany. Okay, so this, this is a current slide. It seems to date that uh, almost 90,000 people have died from this infection worldwide, um, with about 340,000 who have been reported to have recovered. Next slide. So this is where we are in Maryland. This is data that was just released today. Uh, we're up to about 6,200 almost cases of COVID-19 identified in Maryland and 138 deaths as of today, uh, this morning. Um, there are, where our testing is actually being uh, increased, our testing capacity has increased and that may be contributing to what looks like a really exponential increase in the number of cases but but in large part we are seeing a uh, spread of this virus so uh, the increase in cases is in part due to that and then also in part due to the fact that we're actually doing a better job of, of testing people so it may not be as bad as it looks but it is definitely increasing and it's probably uh, in doubling every two to three days we have over, about 1300 people who are being hospitalized uh, with 138 new hospitalizations in the past 24 hours. And the, the counties that are hit the hardest right now are Prince George's County and Montgomery County. Next slide. So what new today, the state of Maryland did finally release data broken down by race in the state of Maryland. And as you can see here, uh, African Americans are disproportionately represented among the cases of coronavirus in Maryland and also overrepresented among the deaths. So we are seeing disparities play out in our own state, which is not a surprise as we know we've been seeing um, these statistics from across the country. Next slide. So here are some projections for the next 90 days. Um, our experts in the School of Public Health are saying that in the next couple of weeks, we really expect to see a flattening of the epidemic curves and perhaps a reduction in places like New York. The deaths will continue to increase, unfortunately, because they do lag behind as people are in hospitals. Um, but other locations may begin to take off just like New York did, especially if the social distancing measures have been lax. And we also know that reporting has been limited by test availability but that as that expands, we may see more cases as we saw uh, in the Maryland data. We hope that we'll have better control of the outbreaks by summer and begin to, be, to lift some social distancing measures, um, probably beginning in some areas before others. So I see someone's commenting that, um, that unfortunately we didn't uh, have data on the Hispanic or Latinx community. I know that data is being reported, so um, hopefully that will be um, something that will be available on the dashboard soon. Um, are there any questions before we move on to the next part of the presentation? I... Okay, not hearing uh, any, we're gonna go ahead and move on um, to the next part of the presentation, which focuses on vulnerable populations the topic for our today. So many of you on this call are all too familiar with the groups that are health disparity populations in the United States, shown on this slide, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, low income persons, um, women and children, uh, older adults, people who are homeless or housing insecure, uh, people who are immigrants or refugees or displaced persons, we also have those who are LGBTQ populations, people with special needs, such as those with, with disabilities. Um, we have uh, some certain rural and urban residents, um, and we'll talk more about you know, 
what it is that increases their their vulnerability at this time. We have people with low literacy and low numeracy, people in correctional institutions and also other institutions such as um, and nursing homes. Um, and then we have people with substance abuse disorders who of course are at risk for uh, poor health outcomes. Next slide. So why are these people at risk and what challenges do they have that will, will be magnified during this time? Um, among many of these populations, there's a lack of basic resources. So we've heard a lot about people being concerned about running out of food. Many people don't, cannot afford uh, to pay to buy groceries and stock up for two weeks at a time. In some of our uh, urban areas, we have people who actually don't even have safe uh, drinking water or enough water to, to wash their hands as often as we're asking them to do. People who are homeless or uh, have concerns about uh, housing security uh, are, are also at greater risk during this time because of their challenges with, with social distancing, needing to, social, to engage in social distancing or to, to stay at home. Um, people who don't have access to transportation are getting on public transportation and are therefore being in, uh, exposed at higher levels um, to other people who might have uh, the coronavirus. So we know about the housing environment and conditions. We just talked about that. We've heard about uh, homeless shelters and the fact that um, there's been a lot of spread of corona uh, infection in those um, settings. Many of these populations have a lack of access to healthcare services. They may not have a primary care provider, uh, may not know exactly where to go or who to call if they do uh, feel ill, may be concerned about uh, incurring extra expenses if they uh, lack health insurance. Um, you know, think about if you are uh, also an undocumented person, you may be afraid to seek help, uh, health care at this time. We have people who worry about losing wages or losing their employment at this point in time and maybe increasing their risk of exposure by, by going to work and having to work, actually, uh, outside of their homes. Uh, lots of folks in this group lack access to services uh, for communication. So important services like uh, internet service, which might be important for children, for example, who are uh, forced to stay at home right now uh, and, and would need to use uh, internet and computers to be able to do their schoolwork. Um, telephone and uh, cell phone services, and like, like we say, um, uh, access to unlimited data is needed if you want to uh, Used to take advantage of telemedicine services. We've also heard a lot of a report of increase in domestic violence and abuse uh, during high-risk populations during this time in the United States and actually around the world. So we know that that's, these challenges are magnified when people are stressed, um, worried about uh, money and food, and uh, they are forced to stay in close uh, quarters with each other. And then we have the distrust of institutions, which is understandable due to discriminatory experiences that many people in these populations have experienced. So next slide. So this just shows you a, a few uh, articles that have come out recently. Actually, there's been an explosion of articles about disparities in the number of corona cases and in the deaths from coronavirus in many large uh, my, um, urban areas around the country, including New York City, Chicago, um, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, New Orleans, um, Louisiana, and now we have data for Maryland, the state of Maryland as well. Um, the, the data from New York actually show that uh, not only African Americans, but also Hispanics have been uh, hit very hard, and they're showing the communities on this map uh, in the Bronx, for example, showing the highest number of coronavirus cases in the New York area. So. Uh, South Bronx in particular, and Staten Island, which are known to be predominantly ethnic minority communities. So we're not surprised at all by any of this, um, those of us who work in this area, but it is getting a lot of national attention. And um, this is an opportunity for us to actually speak up and uh, help to intervene in this issue. Next slide. So these are also, this is some media coverage about the fact that uh, ethnic minorities are, are often not able to uh, engage in social distancing, that it's actually a privilege and not everyone can work from home. 
So this whole article, uh, these two articles actually talked about the fact that many minorities uh, work in essential jobs uh, in government, in transportation, in healthcare, and in custodial work, where uh, or food supply and food delivery. And so uh, they're out there um, ex being exposed um, to uh, infection, and um, it's really important for us to be considering what we can do to urge uh, employers to protect these workers. Um, but but so you know, my point is that we most of us on this call know, but not everyone knows this, that it's not about biology or something or genetics that's making uh, minorities uh, more likely to get sick or to die from this virus, that it's about these social conditions. Um, next slide. So um, my colleague Josh Sharfstein and I wrote a, a, an op-ed in Politico this week that was published basically urging policymakers to come up with a game plan to help the most vulnerable, that it's actually not enough for us to just stay at home or to wear masks, but we actually need to go about doing something about these issues. So we, we made some recommendations around expanding housing. So for example, providing dorms and uh, hotel rooms for people who are housing insecure so that they could safely engage in social distancing and quarantining themselves. Providing food, by uh, making sure that uh, there's food delivery uh, available, um, food pantries, that there's an expansion of SNAP and WIC benefits and things like that during this time. Uh, urging policymakers to support educational strategies such as providing computers and, um, and urging internet providers to, to provide uh, free internet access during this time so that uh, people who are stuck at home can uh, continue their education. Um, protecting workers, we talked a lot about that. Um, you know, making sure people have paid sick leave, that they do have uh, coverage of healthcare coverage, that they um, are not put in harm's way and that we do offer them protections and, um, you know, have clients and consumers to wear masks so that they don't expose workers unnecessarily. Uh, making sure everybody knows what the best practices are for um, for social distancing, expanding healthcare access, making sure that people who lose their jobs or are furloughed have the ability to apply uh, through health insurance exchanges, um, expanding Medicaid in in different states so that people can enroll for Medicaid if needed, and more most important of all is partnering with trusted members of our communities. Um, these organizations, many of you that are part of uh, this call, who uh, have been longstanding members of the vulnerable communities, know everyone and um, know what the, the needs and issues are and can help to address uh, the needs for basic resources at this time. And also for the upcoming months and years, which we know are gonna you know, be significantly more difficult for our vulnerable populations due to the economic impact. Next slide. So before we move on, we just wanted to stop and, and talk with you about what approaches you're currently impl implementing at your healthcare system or your organization during this outbreak. Um, we had heard a lot last week. Uh, don't know how much has changed, but um, a lot about changes in your workflows, um, moving more to sort of telemedicine and telework. Uh, other things like that, having some places having to uh, deploy staff to to cover mm -hmm. services that they don't they don't typically cover. So, does anybody want to um, share anything that you're doing at your organization right now? You can feel free to unmute yourself or to type uh, into the chat box. All right, well, we've got a quiet group this week as opposed to last week. Um, what we can do is then we can go on and talk about some of the things that we know are happening um, and that we have been you know, working on here at the Center for Health Equity. So one of the things we've developed is a, an assessment, a patient assessment. Okay, I see someone from JHCP Hagerstown is talking about breaking staff into smaller groups to work in office and others to work from home and rotating. That sounds like an excellent strategy uh, for protecting staff. 
Um, and so, and I know that uh, others have been working on similar strategies. Anybody else want to chime in before we move on? Dr. Cooper, it's Sherry. How are you? Fine. Hi, Sherry. Nice to hear from you. <laughs> Good to be heard. I just wanted to um, let you know, I, I had mentioned this to you guys in a previous uh, email, but just to share with the group, you know, of work at Chop Tank uh, Community mm -hmm. Health on the Eastern Shore. Mm -hmm. And um, we are doing primarily the things that you already mentioned. We, we've stepped up our telehealth and telework programs. Um, we do curbside visits for patients that either, you know, need to be screened for COVID-19 or uh, for those patients who have who have need for a visit that can't be addressed, you know, by the, the telemedicine. So um, some patients that, you know, have like COPD or asthma and you really need to listen to their lungs because we don't have plug-ins for our programs yet. So, you know, we, we still have to either get the patient to have access to, uh, you know, uh, um, for other issues for, you know, either their own weight scale or a thermometer or blood pressure cover, that kind of thing. So for those kind of uh, issues that come up where patients can't readily, you know, do those kinds of measurements or, or uh, kind of objective kind of things, we get them uh, to come to the curbside and we go out to the car uh, and meet them and, uh, you know, do the assessment. Um, the other thing that Chop Tank's doing, um, is trying to really focus on employees as well. Mm -hmm. um, we do, uh, I, I, and I think that's really important. You know, I, I think it kind of gets sometimes overlooked in, in the need to, uh, to address the wellness of the community. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, we, we have been doing uh, at least daily updates by uh, email and by Zoom uh, on the um, uh, pandemic. Uh, but we've also started a once a week um, Zoom meeting for wellness uh, for employees. It talks about um, meditation and yoga and some of the things that you actually have done in previous uh, Rich Life um, uh, activities that we've done. Um, so I, I think that's that's uh, nice and certainly we've um, we've we tried to stay as engaged with with other uh, organizations. Um, especially emergency preparedness and the local jurisdiction health departments. Um, because cause as, as we discussed in email the other day, we are all in this together. We all need to support each other. And, and I'm, just, I'm just happy that we're able to do that. And I have no idea how to unmute myself, so I'll try not to say anything oh, else. <laughs> you're fine. You're fine. We could hear you very well. And thank you so much for sharing that, Sherry. You are so right. We are all in this together, and that's why you know, we try to create this forum so people can kind of share what they're doing and, and what seems to be working well. And so it, it sounds like you guys are doing a lot of things that we're, um, we're going to be talking about a little bit more, but, you know, for your, for your own employees in particular, who many of us, you know, need to remember that some of our employees also fall into these high risk and vulnerable groups. And so, you know, even though we are serving those populations, some of us and our family members fall into these groups as well. And that, you know, we have, uh, one of the reasons we have a commitment to this is because it's, it's personally um, important to us. So thank you again. And um, yeah, we'll talk more about um, any other concerns you've had about uh, doing the, you know, the changes in your workflow and how you protect your staff. It sounds like you're probably gonna need to have staff do screen patients for symptoms and you know, of course, use uh, some masking and things like that to protect themselves, even while they're um, going out to cars. And then, of course, you know, having to deal with people who may not even have cars, and and how do you, you know, kind of meet their needs? So, thank you for sharing that. So, we just wanted to to go ahead and share some of the um, the patient assessment tool that we've developed, and hope that you might find it useful. Um, uh, all of these materials and this presentation will be posted on the website as well as a recording of the webinar uh, on our resources page, which we'll show you towards the end of the presentation. But the assessment basically um, is something that your uh, nurses or uh, care managers, uh, community health workers can use. Uh, that's what we're having our Rich Life team to use is we're having them when they reach out to patients is to ask them what they've heard about the novel coronavirus or COVID-19. 
um, and allowing the patient to share what they know. And if they're not aware of many things, to, to provide them with some educational materials, which we also um, include many links and many resources on our webpage. We ask them to ask the patients what concerns they have um, and allow the patient to share their concerns. We give them some guidelines around how to empathize with patients and how to correct uh, misinformation. Um, and asking them to avoid sharing personal opinions, but really sticking to the facts um, and encouraging them to, to use information provided by the, the local uh, health department, uh, by the CDC, and also um, by their own health systems. Okay, next slide. So then we have a specific questions related to urgent uh, needs. And many of these needs are, are social needs, but we also start out with medical needs. Then we ask, we have a, a, an assessment that specifically asks whether people are worried or have an urgent need of, related to housing or food insecurity or transportation. And we provide uh, example questions as you can see on the slide. Um, next slide. Some of the other uh, uh, urgent needs we assess are utility needs, um, interpersonal safety concerns, uh, needs for social or emotional support, whether people have concerns around their employment. And then we also leave a space for any other concerns that patients may have that we may not have considered. So again, we hope we you find this uh, assessment tool to be useful to you. Um, and um, we're gonna be tracking uh, what, what uh, concerns our patients have. So next slide. So again, this is the COVID-19 resources page that the center has um, developed on our website. Um, this, it, like I said, this will be available to you after the webinar on our healthequityhub.com website under resources. And uh, we have an extensive resource guide uh, that our team and others around Johns Hopkins have collaborated on to provide you with uh, uh, extensive information around housing, transportation, food, um, you know, uh, resources related to substance abuse, uh, treatment, um, violence, all those kinds of issues um, uh, available through this resource. Uh, includes resources throughout the state of Maryland as well as Pennsylvania. Okay, do we have any questions before we go on to the next part of the presentation? All right, not hearing any, we're gonna move on to the changes in care delivery. And we, we heard uh, some of this from Sherry just now and from JHCP um, Hagerstown. So we know that a lot of you have been doing, uh, changing your workflows. And so the general principles are around uh, limiting how germs can enter your facility, isolating your symptomatic patients as soon as possible, so setting up separate well-ventilated triage areas and, and putting patients in private rooms with the doors closed and uh, basically uh, converting most of your visits to telemedicine at this point in time and only seeing people who have to be seen. And then a lot of uh, protections for healthcare personnel. So again, we have some uh, references here for you in case you need uh, any of those. Next slide. So around telemedicine, Johns Hopkins has been recommending that all patients should be seen by video or telephone unless there was a specific need for in-person evaluation. And so our uh, numbers of telemedicine visits have gone up incredibly. We're now seeing like thousands of people um, through telemedicine versus uh, inpatient visits. Treating those visits just the same as office visits, contacting them with updates if the provider's running behind, seeing them in scheduled order, um, and then um, documenting um, these visits in the electronic medical record. Okay, next slide. Uh, for the patients, we know a lot of our patients don't have the ability to have video visits with us. Um, some of them, though, are willing to use FaceTime on their cell phone and Skype, so these platforms are approved for use uh, during the COVID crisis only. So you can use these other uh, platforms that typically wouldn't be used, um, things like, and also Google uh, Duo, you know. Um, and then if the patient can't do any of those things, then a regular telephone call. And I see one of our participants, uh, Cherie Wilson, is urging 
uh, the use of interpreter services for patients who have limited English proficiency, as well as those who are uh, hearing impaired or deaf. Um, let's not forget uh, that those vulnerable groups as well. It's really critically important at this point in time. So hopefully uh, many of you do have access to those uh, services at your um, locations. If not, and if you need you know, further help with that, uh, feel free to reach out to us. Okay, next slide. So again, these are the, uh, the outpatient office guidelines for screening, and many of you are well into this now. Last week, um, this was still new for a lot of people, but I think a lot of people have gotten into this now. Um, having the, the, the screening questions that are available um, related to respiratory symptoms, fever, uh, muscle aches, uh, headache, diarrhea. There's also a loss of taste or smell, uh, whether people have a known exposure to someone. Uh, so if they have any of these symptoms, uh, the respiratory or fever symptoms, and I mean, or sorry, or they've had exposure to um, a person who is a confirmed COVID-19 case or any of the other symptoms like having a loss of taste or smell, and importantly, if they work in a long-term care facility, because we know that those settings are places where um, the COVID-19 infection has really been spreading pretty rapidly. And if people say yes to any of those questions, then you basically um, make sure that they are masked and uh, isolated. And, um, and, then, and then put them in a room like we mentioned before. Okay, next slide. So these again are all face-to-face -face visits and we know that most of these are not happening anymore. So, uh, you know, these guidelines are gonna be available to you about uh, where you kind of isolate the patient and stay outside the room and then uh, probably have them have a telephone interview with them. You know, there's a phone in the room and, and wearing having the staff then put on um, protective um, equipment to the extent that you, whatever you have, available to you, whether it's a surgical mask along with a face shield or whether you have N95 masks. We know a lot of those are in short supply and uh, tend to be reserved for uh, hospital patients or uh, for um, very um, invasive procedures. Next slide. So home visits, you know, we have been hearing that most of the home visits have been converted to video or telephone but there are some exceptions. And so in our system, there are people who are still getting a home visit and then basically the same procedure for an outpatient visit of the screening um, questions and uh, social distancing measures would be followed. And then, um, the, but the idea is that we really wanna to try to keep people away from the emergency room or the hospital. So that's the whole, you know, point behind doing all of these telephone screenings and even doing an, an in-home screening is to really sort of prevent um, people from coming in and overwhelming the system and then also probably uh, getting further exposed and being more likely to get sick. Next slide. So um, my colleague Tony Bunyasai is going to talk with you now about uh, some measures to protect staff. But before he does that, are there any questions? on this section of the presentation. Great, we have a lot fewer questions this week as things people are sort of getting settled in. So yeah, Tony, take it away. Oh, hi everyone. Um, sorry. Uh, hi, um, so I just have uh, uh, two slides um, to, uh, to share with you. Um, but in essence, uh, you know, we, with an epidemic like this, uh, we want to think about uh, two sets of uh, things uh, related to protecting the staff. Um, there are uh, there, uh, just like uh, folks who uh, have to show up for um, uh, uh, in-person work um, uh, that Lisa described earlier uh, among our vulnerable communities, uh, our uh, healthcare workers um, and the other uh, staff members uh, from uh, environmental services and and uh, um, the kitchen uh, also uh, have to show up to work to um, uh, protect patients as well. And there are two areas where I think uh, we can think about as organizations for uh, protecting our staff. The first is clinically, 
um, uh, thinking about ways, uh, both organizationally and in terms of things like PPE, to uh, protect um, our staff uh, by limiting the amount of time or opportunities uh, with which they can uh, be exposed to uh, potential uh, uh, contagion. Uh, this can be done uh, by things like we're doing now with uh, telework. Uh, other things that can be done are uh, reducing uh, the number of people who have to do a task to the, uh, to the uh, minimum number of people who have to do it at any one particular time. And then perhaps arranging for uh, flexibility and backup in the schedule if, uh, if your overall staff allows for that in order to uh, uh, take in the possibility that some people might either get sick uh, briefly or, uh, or need to come off, uh, off the work rotation uh, briefly uh, before they can come back in. Um, I think uh, Lisa's already talked a lot about PPE um, and um, uh, the, the other area where um, uh, our organizations can do uh, uh, work to protect our staff is in terms of uh, mental health. Uh, this can be a stressful time, uh, not only for all the changes that are happening outside of work, but all the changes that are occurring in, work, in our workplace settings. And uh, we can certainly uh, address that uh, in at least three ways. Uh, the first is to uh, address um, uh, communication with our staffs um, uh, in a way that's proactive and, uh, and increases transparency. And I believe Jill in an upcoming set of slides will be describing some best practices uh, for doing that. Uh, second is we can uh, be actively uh, monitoring uh, how people are doing. And then finally, uh, to uh, ensure that there are uh, resources that uh, uh, staff members can uh, call upon uh, should they be feeling uh, uh, moral distress or uh, psychological distress or emotional distress. Um, and uh, and uh, things like um, uh, there are resources that are available on the um, uh, Center for Health, Health Equities websites for, uh, for uh, mental health support and emotional support. Um, um, uh, which which you can find there. Um, if you will proceed to the next slide. Um, I think, uh, you know, in terms of uh, PPE uh, protection, I, I, you know, Lisa has described this already, but um, I, I guess I'll just limit it by saying that right now, uh, uh, PPE is still um, a limited uh, resource, a scarce resource and that uh, there are some staff members who are coming into much closer contact with uh, patients who are infected than others. Uh, so our uh, approach to this has really been to, um, to limit, uh, uh, you know, to, to um, allocate these resources, prioritize these resources uh, for people who are going to be at greatest risk and uh, um, uh, provide, um, uh, things like uh, homemade masks or uh, surgical masks uh, for staff members who are coming into the hospital um, but uh, uh, not necessarily coming into uh, direct contact. Um, and I think that's really what I have to, uh, to say in terms of protecting our uh, colleagues. Um, are there any questions uh, for me or I'll hand it back to Lisa. Thanks, Tony. So important for us to um, remember to protect our, our staff, all of our staff, and not only just the clinical staff, but the people who do all of the cleaning and uh, do all the other support services in our hospitals and healthcare settings. Um, all right, next slide. So we're gonna talk about any uh, current testing and treatment guidelines. This changes um, on, a, on almost like a every other day basis. So um, we wanted to just ask you though, first, um, whether do you have uh, availability of testing and how are you prioritizing testing in your, your populations? What's the, your availability of testing in your areas? Do you feel um, comfortable with that? I know it's improved over the last week or two. So maybe some of our um, health system people, we have one person, Kara Bauer from Total Healthcare. Um, we have Sherry, of course, from Chop Tank. And um, we have uh, JHCP folks on the line. So anybody want to chime in about testing and how it's going in your areas?
Dr. Cooper, it's Sherry again. Hi, Sherry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure 100%. Um, I, I think we're still getting a limited number of tests, um, but we're doing three different things. One, we're ordering directly through, <clears throat> excuse me, through um, LabCorp. Um, and I, I don't know that we're having issues with that. We're getting some uh, testing from the government. I think those are like 15 kits a week. Mm -hmm. um, it might be less than that, though. But yeah. the uh, the other uh, thing is for um, employees, we are able to get expedited testing through the health department, okay. um, which is really helpful in, you know, controlling the spread and, and maintaining the health of our employees, but at either through through the health department. Thank you. Yeah, and I see Kara was um, mentioning that testing is still somewhat limited. This is in Baltimore City um, and advising folks to stay at home if they have mild symptoms and not testing them. Um, and then at EBMC, I see someone saying there's no testing being done there, but there is testing available at Johns Hopkins Hospital. That's right. Uh, the, the lab at Johns Hopkins Hospital is now able to test, to do a thousand tests per day, actually. That's increased dramatically. So um, it's going, that is going to be an incredible resource. Um, oh, so yeah, someone from EBMC is also saying that there's a availability to have home care nurses to go to patients who are too ill to come for the testing. So that's, that's good to hear that that is a resource. So how do people get access to the tests at Johns Hopkins Hospital? So they have to have a provider uh, to complete a, re a test request, okay? And then once they do that, uh, then uh, they can call and get an appointment to come uh, to the hospital. Most of the time it's gonna be required for them to come in a car. Uh, so that's a challenge we know for many people. Uh, we know that there are some drive-through centers um, that they're using the emissions testing centers um, in um, around uh, the state. The turnaround time Kara's asking is, uh, is actually only five to seven hours right now um, at Johns Hopkins Hospital. The test request, I, you know, we'll look for the phone number. I believe that you can, if someone can do that while we're on the line, but there is a, a, a phone number um, that providers can call uh, for the, the COVID uh, CART Center uh, to get information about how to uh, request a test at Johns Hopkins. Yeah, I don't know if anybody has time to look look for that number while we're still online, but I appreciate that so that um, Kara can get that. And Kara, if we don't get it before the end of the call, we'll make sure to get it to you shortly thereafter. Okay, so let's talk about the current testing and guidelines. Let's move more into it. So we know, yes, that not everyone needs to be tested um, for COVID-19, but it's really, you know, we're, we're trying to do a better job of this as we move along because that will allow us to isolate people. Thank you. I see someone was kind enough to share the, the phone number for COVID testing at Hopkins Hospital. Thank you so much. Um, it's true that if people have mild illness and are able to stay home, uh, that that is a good idea. And then to do close follow-up of those people, um, to be checking in with them, you know, every couple of days to make sure that they're um, not doing, um, not getting worse and uh, that they know when to call uh, for help. Um, we don't have any treatment that's specifically approved for the virus. So, um, you know, it's not as if testing will give somebody access to some sort of treatment that will make them miraculously better, but it, it, it is helpful to inform decision making around who, who should actually uh, have a face-to-face -face contact. So I think um, right now with limited availability of testing, it still makes sense to have people stay at home and uh, isolate themselves if they can do so safely. But we know if they have these other challenges, we're going to need to make sure that we um, provide resources for them to be able to do that. Make sure they have food, make sure they have uh, a safe uh, space and enough space where they can um, be separated from other family members who might be vulnerable to getting sick. Next slide. 
um, to get an appointment at a vehicle emissions testing program. Um, this is the, the, the information here. There's a, uh, a PDF uh, that, that you can access online that tells you how your uh, provider can submit an order to the VIP location. And then thanks to uh, folks on uh, the call for posting the numbers at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Again, we'll make these numbers available on our resource webpage. Okay, um, and we, we know a lot of these testing sites have been expanded uh, throughout Maryland now. So uh, the health, your local health department will also have information about uh, testing sites that are near you. Next slide. Again, um, people have limited uh, transportation, people who have limited um, transportation, um, they should call first. Again, here's a lot of the phone numbers that we were asking for, the COVID Ambulatory Response Team or CART access line. Um, and then they can be screened by phone and then told um, when to show up. If they can't leave, there's this limited av availability to arrange home care to perform the testing. Okay. All right, um, next slide. Um, again, we're testing people who have severe symptoms. Um, at, at then when, if there's a question of them needing care in a hospital, uh, if they have a, a, an existing uh, comorbid medical condition such as diabetes or heart disease, chronic lung disease, chronic kidney disease, or are on immunosuppressive therapy. Also, if they're working in a healthcare environment or to provect, providing direct care to patients, or if they're living in a group setting, such as a nursing home, assisted living, or a facility for non-elderly disabled persons. Okay, next slide. Um, this is, again, just the algorithm uh, for around testing. Um, and this is specifically for Johns Hopkins Medicine, so may not be particularly uh, relevant to everyone. But again, the, just the criteria are um, on the top of the table in blue. Uh, if the person is a low risk person, less than age 65, not a healthcare worker, immunocompetent, uh, testing is not recommended. But again, people who are at higher risk for transmission uh, would be uh, recommended for testing, as well as those who are higher risk with uh, regard to age or having a chronic disease. And then also, uh, or immunocompromised, or also persons who are either pregnant or within two weeks of postpartum of, of any age, okay? All right, next slide. Again, uh, we, we know that there are no currently available treatments uh, or vaccine yet. There are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of work going on, a lot of clinical trials of different agents, including chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. There's also a, a trial that's just started up where, where they're using the serum of people who have um, recovered from coronavirus uh, and um, using that convalescent serum uh, uh, clinical trial going on. So you know, as we know, a lot of uh, our patients may not have access to these trials. It depends on what um, setting they are in, but um, just to let them know that, uh, that there are some trials going on, but there's no known treatment. So people shouldn't be trying to get prescriptions for chloroquine or anything like that because um, it could actually cause more problems for them. So um, right now we don't have a clear answer. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, some people are talking about the fact that there's such a long wait time for tests and that is a concern um, that it might be a five to seven day wait. And so people might have to just be at home quarantined until they get their response uh, to that test. Fortunately, the test at Hopkins turns around in about five to seven hours. Um, so um, yeah, no one should be using any specific drug right now to treat patients with COVID who are uh, not ill enough to be in the hospital. Um, so um, I'm just answering questions from the chat box. And then if people are experiencing respiratory distress and um, are unable to get through to someone, they should definitely call 911 and let, um, that, let them know um, uh, that they do have COVID-19. Okay, next slide. Um, I'm going to turn over to my colleague, uh, Jill Marsteller, to offer this portion of the presentation. 
Um, the slides were developed um, by our colleague, Josh Sharfstein, who is Vice Dean of Public Health Practice and Community Engagement in the school, Bloomberg School of Public Health, um, and with some uh, input and adaptation by us. So, Jill? Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody, and uh, let's move to the next slide. So we really wanted to give you some background or some ideas about how to communicate uh, both within your own organization as well as um, to uh, your patient populations. Um, but you know, a lot of your, your staff and of course your patients are gonna be turning to you as leaders uh, to help them understand um, COVID and, and the implications uh, for them. So um, these are important messages to try to communicate and they uh, came to us through CDC. So first of all, they suggest um, be first, meaning hold some regular briefings. Be sure that you're communicating frequently and that you're sharing information as you get new developments, you share, continue to share that um, so that you come out as a leader and you are a trusted individual um, uh, within your system for information on this. So hold those regular briefings. Be right. Do not overly reassure. Uh, be sure to focus on the facts um, and then be credible. So link with some local experts or use CDC or WHO information, um, state provided information to uh, provide additional voices to your messages. You can back that up with some expertise uh, from these different organizations that have already done a lot of research to try to understand the best ways to uh, communicate around COVID-19. Then express empathy. Make sure that people know that you're on their side and that you're there to support them. And be sure to promote action um, by telling people what they can do. Many people feel that they're lucky to be healthy or they're lucky to be on the side um, of those as yet unaffected. Um, tell them what they can do and how they can help out. Um, and of course, always show respect and be aware that people are under a lot of stress and that they really need um, your respect and empathy um, in order to be able to get through this situation. Next slide. So what are the key messages that you should be sharing? Um, first of all, that the, the situation is a serious threat to the health of our community, that everyone has to do their part to reduce the spread of this virus. And even though it might be um, very inconvenient, um, it's important for us to socially distance when we can, um, people might carry the virus without showing symptoms. So this message, you of course know this, but it's gotta be repeatedly delivered to other populations. Helping community members uh, in general means maintaining that social distancing to avoid infecting those folks who are extremely um, vulnerable. Next slide. So people should all be staying home when sick. This is a message that you need to drive home as a health system leader. Um, wash the hands regularly with soap and water, cover your coughs and reduce social interactions. Um, while these are difficult actions, they're necessary to protect the health of our entire community. And in addition to that, as information and recommendations change, share the message that you will be on top of it. You will keep people updated and then working together, we're gonna to make it through this difficult time. So that's one of the most important pieces to continually message to your staff and to your patients um, that we are all in this together um, and that we are going to work together to get through this. Next slide. So you also wanna be aware that there is some false information, some uh, misinformation that's circulating out there and so preparing your staff to be able to correct these uh, pieces of misinformation is a wise move. One of the things we've heard is that a disposable face mask will protect you from COVID-19. So this is sort of unclear at this point. Um, for people who don't have any respiratory illness, um, these masks could you know, still allow infected droplets to get into the nose, eyes, or mouth. So it's not necessarily gonna protect someone from the disease, from getting the disease, 
However, it could keep your, your, your own germs to yourself um, and prevent people from spreading the virus to others if they have it and don't see any symptoms. Um, in addition, there's now evidence that it may help people avoid touching their faces. And so that's part of the reason why they are suggesting, CDC is suggesting wearing some kind of a face covering in public settings. Another myth that's out there is that young people don't have to worry because they're less likely to get seriously ill. Um, they can get quite ill, um, they can die, and they can also pass the disease to others. So it's really important to debunk that myth. Next slide. Gargling with bleach or salt water can protect you from COVID-19. So this is one that's circulating out there. Um, clearly these won't protect people from getting COVID-19 and actually um, could be very dangerous. Another myth is that the new coronavirus was deliberately created or released by people, um, but in fact, we think it came from animals uh, and changed to be able to be passed to humans. So it's really important to uh, make it clear that this is not something that was created by humans. Uh, next slide. Another falsehood that's out there is that it can't be transmitted <coughs> in a, <coughs> pardon me, in a hot or humid area. <clears throat> and in fact, um, it can be tr transmitted everywhere. And then um, another one that we've heard is that if you can hold your breath for 10 seconds without coughing, you probably don't have it. So that in fact is not the best way to determine whether you might have COVID-19. The laboratory pest test is the right way to do it. Um, so it's really important to share these kinds of messages, get rid of these falsehoods that are out there. And there's some very helpful resources um, that are uh, contained here in this um, blue box and also on the bottom of the page. Um, and so let's go to the chat. Um, we see that um, Lisa is noting in particular that addressing these kinds of concerns and educating the public about focusing on not discriminating at this time um, is really important as well. So next slide. All right. Um, question. So thank you so much, Jill. Um, and thanks everyone. Yeah, I, I really wanted to thank um, Cherie Wilson for raising the concern that a lot of uh, men of color have brought up is that they are uncomfortable wearing face masks in public because of um, their experiences of discrimination and um, their concern that wearing a face mask would put them at greater risk for being discriminated against or for even being a target of uh, police uh, violence. And so I think that this is gonna be an issue that really needs to be uh, raised uh, on a national level uh, so that people um, are keenly aware of the fact that um, they are at risk for um, engaging in behaviors that are driven by bias and that that needs to be really uh, avoided at this point in time when everyone is being encouraged to wear face masks. So, and then we need to listen with a lot of empathy and try to encourage um, uh, people from these high-risk groups to really practice social distancing. If they're not gonna wear face masks, that they're really gonna have to be very um, vigilant about remaining at least six feet away from other individuals at this time. So are there any other questions or uh, key points that that anyone wants to raise with us? We wanna be respectful of your time. We see that it's now one o'clock. Um, it's been, uh, this has been a very engaging, um, you know, conversation. Um, there's a lot going on. We know there will be more updates and um, issues that come up. We, we encourage you to reach out to us uh, at uh, healthequity at jhmi.edu uh, and to look, go back to our healthequityhub.org website to look for these resources and share them with others. And we won't be doing this uh, on a weekly basis, but if things as change, things change, and if there are significant updates that we think uh, would be helpful to you, we'll reach out to you again and, and hold another session. So thank you again for participating and continue to stay safe and to take care of yourselves and the people who are counting on you. Uh, we appreciate you and we're all in this together. Um, like Sherry Perkins said, so. Uh, eloquently earlier today. Thanks to all of my colleagues and the staff 
for all of the hard work that goes into um, us being able to do this work and our community and health system partners. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye, everyone.